Hello, everybody, and welcome um, back to the Doomer Optimism podcast. Um, just me today hosting Michael Sacassis. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, Michael, um, and then we're just going to get into all things Illich and uh, technology and institutions and conviviality and all that good stuff. So welcome. Uh, thank you. Glad to be here. Um, I'll, I'll say just very briefly, I'm um, the author of a newsletter on technology and society called the Convivial Society, uh, which uh, pays a fairly obvious homage to Illich and the idea of conviviality. Uh, when I uh, first uh, came up with the title, I, I also intended to pay a bit of homage to Jacques Ellul, who also uh, looms very large in my own thinking, as he did for Illich. Uh, and so it was a um, both a gesture towards uh, tools for conviviality, uh, but also the technological society. And it turned out to be a very, um, uh, I think, um, you know, nice title. It doesn't have all of the foreboding of the technological society because of the conviviality element to it. Uh, but Illich and, and Alul are both um, important thinkers to me. Uh, I've been writing that newsletter. It was an outgrowth of an old blog, which itself uh, was something I began to do as I was going through a PhD program uh, in, in a relatively um, in a context in which I did not have too much opportunity for what I would think of as sort of intellectual community. And so I, I began writing online as a way to uh, see if that might not um, address some of that need to some degree, or at least allow me to express myself in writing. Uh, and so the newsletter is, I think, what I have to show for the PhD program that I never finished. Uh, and so it's been very rewarding in a lot of ways, and uh, especially the degree to which um, it has ended up putting me in touch with those uh, in the wider community of um, uh, Illich aficionados. Mm. Um, and I'm presently the director of the Christian Study Center in Gainesville, Florida. It's a, uh, adjacent to but not connected to University of Florida, uh, one of a, a network of similar institutions. Essentially, we try to provide a kind of space for the life of the mind um, and uh, to, to bear kind of witness the Christian intellectual tradition in the university community. So it's um, uh, fun to direct that, and it gives me a lot of um, ample room to cross over my own interests in uh, philosophy of technology, ethics of technology, Illich, and the like. So that's the, the short version. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm going to ask you about the Christian Studies Center later, too. So um, okay. I, I'm look to look forward to diving into that. Um, I want to highlight before we get started that um, so I, I used a quote of yours from the Convivial Society um, it, from your your newsletter in a recent Unheard piece I wrote. I just started writing for Unheard and you're you're writing this analysis um, and I just find it so ironic because we're on Zoom. And the quote I used of yours was, our task is to cultivate an ethos of seeing or new habits of vision ordered toward the good. Um, and it's just so funny because like, you know, despite the fact that we're like aware that we need to have these more uh, in person, um, you know, see people's bodies experiences, we also like just have to use these tools that we have. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So, OK. And then another thing I want to say before we get started is also typically the the whole doomer optimism theme is um you know there's a bunch of things that we're feeling doomy about and there's a bunch of things that we turn to in response to the doom and so typically the the interviews go on this um arc from let's uh, assess what the doom is that we're talking about and then let's turn towards like optimistic solutions so um to get started i want to just briefly touch on this topic of technology the technology question is really big um but one, maybe we, I was thinking that a, a really fun way to talk about it is through the the example of the clock, because it's one that mm -hmm. like uh, a lot of people don't think about. And it's, it's very easy to think about the more extreme things like the metaverse and VR and all this mm -hmm. stuff, but it's less, I think it's more, uh, more of an illustration to be able to um, describe the, what technology does through something as simple and ubiquitous as a clock. Yeah. So maybe we could start right. there. Yeah, no, that's great. I actually I uh, do that a lot. And uh, so if I give a talk that's like, you know, sort of philosophy of technology 101 or something like that, uh, the clock is a frequent example for that for that same reason. It's uh, uh, it, it, it shows how there are aspects of our, our material environment that we hardly think of at all that are that can be still profoundly influential. And, and in fact, the degree to which they fall out of our 
uh, present awareness, I think to that same degree, they become influential in shaping our kind of default understanding of the world. And I think time, time and place, you know, so we're embodied creatures. And so time and place are these two kind of fundamental dimensions of our existence. Uh, and I, I think it's really interesting to look at the ways in which technology shapes those dynamics, um, in part because I think a lot of times we have sort of a naive sense that, uh, well, you know, everybody experiences place the same way, or or time is just time. Everybody experiences it the same the same way uh, in in all uh, cultures and all moments in history, uh, but that's not not quite the case. Um, and so the the clock is a tool that was invented. I think this is the first thing that's you know interesting to do for people to sort of expand the category of what counts as technology. Um, there's a, a quote that you know technology is anything that was made after I was born. And so we think of technology or tech even more so as the latest uh, gadgets or devices or electronic or digital tools. Um, you know, but in fact we're we're surrounded by all sorts of technology that have a very long history, um, and the the clock has a history right so there i think part of what's interesting to do is sort of imagine uh what what would my life be like or what how would i do things if i did not have this tool or that tool and then we can kind of begin to think about how it has shaped us um there are very mundane ways in which we can do this all the time i was thinking the other day about how uh there was a uh, you know when i was younger and i i was trying to figure out the lyric of a song i couldn't just look it up on google i had to uh you know listen strain at the radio or else you know rewind play rewind play on a, on a cassette deck or something if i didn't own the you know the uh, the record in any case um the way in which we think about time uh, and i think this is you know very morally significant um in the west especially i think we have this sense of uh time as a as a scarce resource and maybe that's a theme we'll come back to more than once in this conversation, I don't know, but um, it's a scarce resource. We feel like we're losing it. Um, we feel like we maybe need to hoard it, um, or there is a, a sense in which time is an enemy. Uh, there's a title, a lovely title of a, a book that I've enjoyed, and the title itself is simply uh, Becoming Friends of Time. Mm. Uh, and, I, and I think we, on the other hand, constantly feel as if time is our enemy. Uh, and, and, I, and I think maybe asking, you know, why that's the case, and looking at the way in which the clock has has shaped that. So if I think about time, what, what the clock enabled me to do uh, was to think about time as a series of discrete units. Uh, and if, if you know, imagine if you if you don't have a mechanical clock, um, and certainly, especially not one that you can carry on your person, right? So it's kind of an, an evolution from the, the clock towers of the Middle Ages uh, to more precision timekeeping um, that's available in different public spaces uh, to um, personal timepieces that people would be able to carry with them um, and thus making it possible at any time to sort of uh, check what where you are in this series of discrete moments in a day. Um, and I, I, I cannot plan, I cannot tell somebody, uh, you know, I'll, I'll meet you at 1215 uh, if I don't have that capacity, right? So this way of thinking about how I order my day um, and points of, again, points of contrast are useful here. You know, in certain cultures, if you step out of out of Western culture um, or, or maybe if you step into more, more rural spaces within Western culture, more traditional contexts, um, I'm, I'm actually, um, my background is my parents are Cuban. And so I have a, a kind of a traditional Hispanic background um, where time doesn't quite work exactly the same way in terms of expectations and the etiquette around time. Um, but I, I remember hearing in, in one context that, you know, the, the event will begin when everybody is here, rather than saying something like the event will begin uh, at noon, and and people will either be late or or early to that or on time, um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, these alternative ways of conceiving of time as something other than what the mechanical uh, timekeeping now digital timekeeping allows us to do. So it changes this uh, the way we are able to inhabit time or, or not inhabit it. Um, that and, and I think that's a that's a fascinating case study uh, in the ways in which just our very disposition, our way of thinking about organizing order and relating to uh, um, what makes up our our day to day existence can be very profoundly altered in this case by how we measure it. 
um, I mean, tools of measurement themselves are, are I think, a you know, really interesting category. And the clock falls under that category as, as a way of measuring time and thus changing our relationship to time or how we conceive of, of time. Yeah, I um I have this little anecdote. Um, I went on a retreat. I went to a Catholic high school, all girls Catholic high school. And in the senior year, uh, we go on this retreat where we don't really know what it's going to be. It's kept a secret by anyone who's gone before. And it's like kind of fun mm -hmm. in that way. And uh, mm -hmm. once you get there, you realize they have this little glockenspiel um, that that like marks time and there are no clocks. So you have no idea. Mm -hmm. Um, really what time it is outside of like your sense that the like sun rose and, yeah. the, and the sunset, like, you know, um, but you just know it's time for the next thing when you heard that, those notes, like somebody walking through playing mm. the block and spiel. And it was just such a, um, such a relaxed, um, yeah, just, just sort of a relaxed approach to like, I, you're not looking at your watch all the time saying right. like how much time is left in this session. Like yes. you just be totally fully present until you heard that sound and then okay now we're you know we're, we're not yes. like um feeling this rushed sense of like you know there's this finite thing instead you're just like living totally in the in the moment that there is and you'll be let yeah, someone will let you know and i wonder if there's right. um, some similar sensation in having like a a, a, cl a medieval clock tower keeping time you know that that where it's just in mm -hmm. the background you like you know it will make a noise and so you don't really have to think mm -hmm. about it you don't have to be like looking at it all the time um yeah so that's just a cool that was a great yeah. it's a cool example i like it um okay yeah. so let's talk a little bit about um just briefly about uh you know outlining some more doom um the state of institutions bureaucracy and maybe maybe the examples of school and m the medical industrial complex as two like small examples where we can just explain what's going on with institutions and bureaucracy um that makes it hard for us <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, I my thoughts on this are are very much um, indebted to to Ivan Illich. Uh, I think one you know way of putting it uh, is that our institutions do do not operate at a scale conducive to human flourishing. Um, and and uh, you know, I was going to add about the clock. We can kind of segue or connect these two things together. You know, there. From one perspective, uh, we might say that there are certain advantages to clock time, right? To being able to measure time. So, there there are many features of modern life that cannot operate, cannot run, uh, cannot work at all. Would not be safe to operate apart from uh, the precision of clock time, right? Or we might say there there are ways of coming to understand nature, the natural world, uh, that we would not have uh, come to, would not have been able to. Uh, perceive, if not for the ability to measure time in these, you know, finite and precise ways. Uh, and so I, I always am a little hesitant, uh, as Illich was to, to not come off as a romantic about, you know, some past, you know, techno social configuration. Um, and, and so the, the question of institutions, I think, is that, you know, the, the, the connection here is to say that um, there are, there are, there are advantages to being able to operate at, at a certain scale, or if you just by default have to because of the size of the population or the kind of problem you're trying to solve, um, it it almost pushes you into um, having to scale up or, or operate at scale. But that comes with um, with costs, and I, I certainly would, would say that there are better and worse ways of doing that. Um, so the the question of scale is certainly, I think, one that is important. So when we and, and this is a, an old, almost um, cliched critique of uh, large modern institutions uh, that the human being becomes a number in a system, uh, a cog in the machinery. These are all very time worn. Um, ways of putting the matter, where we feel as if we are running up against um, bureaucratic rules and principles that make no sense in a very specific particular case, uh, or for which there might be some very specific um, uh, way of ameliorating the situation, but because it does not fit within the rules that the bureaucracy has established, those who are the um, uh, in the bureaucracy, trying to administer the bureaucracy, feel unable to to bend these rules one way or another to to do what might be a very humane thing for the person, the concrete particular person with their particular problem in that given moment. And so they 
they bind us into uh, programmatic actions that make the, the, the ability to handle things at scale more possible, create efficiency, um, which comes with its own costs, uh, but that nonetheless bind individuals who are trying to just make their way through through their, their own lives with its unique, with their own unique uh, needs and um, and situations, and so when you you scale up, you lose the ability to be responsive in that way. Um, it, the the pace at which some institutions, if we think of very broadly, um, stretching, I suppose the uh, the term a bit, but if we think of the institution uh, of uh, social media, right, these platforms as large institutions, they they operate at a pace. Uh, and at a scale, not just in terms of the, the amount of people involved, but the amount of information that's being conveyed uh, that leave us feeling exhausted, overwhelmed, um, that uh, change people often in, in very unhealthy ways. And so the, the mismatch between whatever we might think of as hu a human scale that, that is um, conducive to the particular human being, given the limitations of their embodied condition, and then the scale at which modern institutions tend to run, uh, I think that's also that that's one of the you know problems that we experience that I think a lot of us are familiar with. And I think to add to, add to that, um, maybe something that is less obvious but was certainly very much a part of Illich's critique is that our our institutions have a way of forming us as mere consumers, um, and they have a tendency not to empower us. Uh, to be relatively uh, autonomous individuals who are interdependent with their local communities or families or neighborhoods, but become dependent on the kinds of services that these institutions provide. Um, in other words, the the tendency of an institution is to make us into the sort of people that will keep needing that institution in the long run. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, of course, there may be cases where this is so somebody who's permanently disabled. Uh, it, it's not as if uh, you know uh, someone who's permanently disabled needs to um, learn to live without institutions of care that might be absolutely essential to them. So there are always ways in which we can, of course, think of um, examples that don't quite fit this mold. Uh, but I think there is still a general pattern that Illich identified, and which is really at the heart of his critique of schooling and of medicine, of transportation. Um, and, and the tendency was to make us dependent on what the institution can do for us or the products that it can supply to us um, rather than equipping us to care both for ourselves and our communities. Um, I have a very specific example that was provided to me by somebody that I always use because I think it, it is such a, a powerful case in point of what Illich was talking about. Um, and it, I, I was talking to a grad student uh, in, in a university context and uh, they worked in the sciences uh, so they were part of a small lab uh, team that worked at a lab and someone in that context uh, passed away rather suddenly. Um, in fact, in, in the workplace situations are very tragic, sudden and obviously traumatizing um, moment. Uh, as he relates the story, it, there, some of the, the people in that lab, some of his colleagues gathered, a handful gathered together. Uh, to talk to each other about what had happened, uh, to console one another, uh, to help one another. Uh, and at that point, somebody in that small group uh, said something like, well, I, I don't think we should be talking with one another until the counselor arrives. Uh, and so there was this, this sense in which they, some this very natural human thing, capacity, right? Uh, it, was, it was this capacity to care for one another in this moment of kind, uh, you know, this tragedy and trauma. Um, this one person at least felt as if they were not equipped, uh, yeah. certified, perhaps. They, you know, they needed the presence of the professional in order to um, console. And I'm not sure what they felt might have gone wrong. Um, if they simply just felt that they weren't equipped to, to be present in that moment, or if they felt some risk of something maybe going astray without the, the professional's uh, guidance or input. Um, but I think that's one example where, you know, there's, if we might think of sort of the institution of, um, of, of mental health, broadly speaking, which um, I'm sure has done much good. In fact, I know has done much good, and I know people in it who have... Um, 
done good for others. But if if we are rather than being empowered, are, are simply taught to depend upon its services or the services of those certified by it, mm-hmm. I think we we lose something really vital and important. Um, and if you multiply this across, you know, multiple areas and, and arenas of life, you know, if we if we look at what we are able to do for ourselves and our communities, and I and I, and I have added a couple of times this note of interdependence because I think for Illich it was never merely about becoming a rugged individual. Um, it was always a kind of um, you know personal autonomy and, cap- and capability for the sake of mutual interdependence that's his phrase right so it's, it's for our ability to help one another and and i i don't think um you know it would, would have been foolish enough to say that we can do all things for ourselves that there's never a point at which somebody might be able or some institution might be able to service in certain ways but i suppose that there are thresholds this is another lichian concept right there are there are thresholds uh where the institutions become counterproductive um because they now begin to make us more dependent rather than empowering us. So those are two, the, the question of scale and, and the question of, of a lear, a kind of learned dependence, which robs human beings of the gift, being able to care for themselves and others, the consolations that come from that sense of value and place in a community that comes from that, um, that we are at risk of losing when we have outsourced um this not a word ill choose but i think it's, it's a word that you know captures a, a dynamic outsourced these capacities that human beings have to institutions yeah this is so great because um i just feel like this is uh, like a lot of us in the doomer optimism sphere are sort of coming to these same conclusions um independent of necessarily having read Illich. So it's just kind of, it's just really cool to see that these, um, these ideas are, they're, they're just so relevant for this moment. Um, and it's so, it's like, yeah, everything you're saying is totally resonates with, with like most of our conversations here. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the things I really want to pick up on that I think is super important to highlight is um, when you push back on the sort of like totalizing globalized uniculture of everything um or you uni- the technology you know just accelerating um in in extreme ways um and people like uh sort of accuse you of being a luddite i think it's really important what you said about um you know the clock example like sometimes you need these this very precise clock time but it just because in some cases you need that doesn't mean in all cases all the time you should be using that so it's a lot of us push back on this it's it's a sort of like case specific uh diverse application of things which yes, right. uh, is so hard to communicate in like sound bites or tweets right you know, it's like uh the, you know i don't like this thing for this context is doesn't hit quite as hard as like x is bad in all cases you know what i mean so right. Um, it just like sort of forces a nuance, more nuanced conversation if people are willing to have it. And I think it's absolutely essential because there are certain technologies that are necessary in certain yeah. c- circumstances and, and, and shouldn't just be the, the bare minimum or, you know, the base, um, technology that all of us have ruling our lives. Um, and then another thing that just keeps coming up is this, these, these two other polls, which are, um, that come up a lot in doom or optimism, um, because people are capable um, or leaning into our agency and leaning into like, we have a lot of power as individuals or families or communities, people then immediately jump to like, no man is an island, you know, and and we're saying, we're not saying that we're saying like, just because we're saying people are capable doesn't mean that you then can't also have a mutual interdependence or be right. a more useful member of a mutually interdependent society because you are right. more capable as an individual or more capable on a family scale or on a neighborhood scale that makes you a better contributor. So um, those things come up a lot too. It's like, it's neither everything is outsourced to institutions, nor everything is capable on the individual scale. It's somewhere in between, but in a way in which the power um, that gets built on a lower scale reinforces the the strength of the mutual interdependence. Um, Turning toward 
how we get toward to, and I want to like just focus the rest of the conversation in this direction, how we get to where we want to go. Um, you had a quote in this other podcast I was listening to you on this morning. Um, maybe the problems are in fact so deep that we need to begin rebuilding at this extremely simple level that won't give us the immediate outcomes we desire, but will give us a foundation to build on in maybe a hundred years. This is such a hard concept for people um, just to think like, you know, things are just pretty, pretty out of whack and pretty out of control. And to just think about building on like the minimum possible scale. Um, I'm wondering if we can talk about that a bit because um, I recently I've been encountering people who are trying to build on too high a scale. Um, you know, maybe we just need a cryptocurrency. Maybe we just need like a DAO and that will like solve all the problems of these institutions. Um, or, uh, you know, intentional communities, for example, would be a scale, which I think you're trying to do too much at once, solve too many problems of the modern world and institutions. And then those end up coming crashing down because they're, um, you know, they're trying to redo governance and social relations and like all aspects of yeah. daily life and coordinating all of that. Um, you know, like I think scaling down the solutions, we, maybe we could just start there, like, you know, the, just uh, starting small. I think it's hard for people. They want, they say like, our problems are global. Our solutions need to be global kind of thing. Yeah, my goodness. Yeah, this is um, um, a, a yeah, wonderful question. And, and I think you're right because I feel a lot of these same tensions and in, in writing just about technology broadly, um, that same dynamic is one I frequently um, encounter, or, or at least it's a part of my own sort of inner, inner thinking about some of these questions. And, and I, I think I understand where people are coming from when they look at the scale of our problems and feel as if, well, the, the solutions have to, to meet that scale. And, and um, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily sure that's always wrong uh, and, and that's fine, right? But I, I think a lot of times, um, when, when I arrive at that point, I'm not sure uh, how we got to that point in that previous uh, podcast. Um, but I, I, I think what I might have had in mind is again, going back to Illich, you know, Illich, his intellectual journey, um, the, the trajectory of his work goes from these very bracing critiques of modern institutions, industrial institutions in the 1970s. Um, so schooling, medicine, transportation, uh, the three most prominent that come to mind. Uh, and, and, and it begins to shift. And I think Illich asks himself, um, you know, why, why did so little change? Or, or when it seemed as if there was, you know, this momentum, why, why did so little change? And I'm kind of condensing the story, but he, he comes to see that there are certainties, he called them certainties, deep, deep assumptions that people may not even be aware of holding that were where the where the roots of the problem lay even below the level of institutional structures um i have opened before me uh, david cayley's um yvonne illich intellectual journey which i would recommend to anybody who's interested in illich um read illich and then read read cayley on illich or read them together they're great um but um from th those certainties then this turn in Illich's focus towards um, towards media, in a sense, and in a very broad sense, almost in a, in a kind of McLuhanist sense, um, the um, the book in the Vineyard of the Text is sort of an example from this period, and then finally to to an understanding focus on the body and the importance of embodiment in the senses, and it's, it's almost like the the scale is is coming down at each of those levels, right? The scale of his focus is coming down. Um, and even in his talk about politics and friendship and, and at, at numerous places at this late stage in his career where it, it is as if the change must begin with the face-to-face -face encounter or, or with the small group that is able to drive at the truth of things because they have built trust amongst themselves, right? And I, I think of that, uh, he's writing this uh, in the late 90s mid to late 90s, he, he passed away in 2002. Um, and I think of this in the context of the public sphere today where, where someone said, we, you know, we, from one perspective, are, are seeking truth, are seeking community, but at this enormous scale um, that 
is, you know, it drives at um, all sorts of disorders in interpersonal relationships, um, creates immense pressures, um, creates almost a presumption of bad faith amongst the participants. And so this idea that that where we need to learn to be human again is in these small, extremely small scale encounters um, where I just learn to relate to my neighbor uh, again in a more humane way. I think that's that's the kind of thing I had in mind right at the beginning there. And 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 when I when I when somebody may say, well, that's almost a foolish way of thinking about how to address our problems. I more recently I just come to think maybe it's foolish not to think that you're gonna we have to start at that level, right? Maybe maybe I'm the one taking the problems more seriously. Um, to, <laughs> I feel to I feel like that. I feel I feel yeah. like that so much. I mean, even sometimes I bring up the concept of like you know just plant a few potatoes with your kids or keep some chickens in your backyard, and people think like we can't solve global warming with like a couple chickens. And I'm just like, but maybe we could like, maybe it is actually the act of interacting with nature in this, in this like embodied way that is exactly what we yeah. need more of in a widespread sense. Right. I, it's, it's, it's a, a sense of you, if you, you need to transform a culture and, and Illich has these places in uh, tools for conviviality, for example, where, you know, um, I don't have the quote commits to memory, but it, it, it's, it's something like this. The, the choice is either, um, a kind of um, technocratically managed collapse on the one hand, or the imposition of a totalitarian managerialism on the other, or right. So that's those are those are the two choices he sees unfolding before us. But what he wants to suggest is that, or or people learn to desire the good that can be found in the path of conviviality right um that the kind of uh, in some cases you know austerity now sort of a loaded word because the way it's kind of you know out of the, the 2008 um mm -hmm. uh crisis you know in the way the connotations is taken up but but that there's a a certain joy in the austerity of, of living living within certain limits which to modern ears sounds like you know no good at all right because <laughs> we have been taught as i've put it in one case you know that that happiness is always on the other side of more mm -hmm. and that uh, any acknowledgement of a limit is sort of taboo um but but i think what illich uh you know wendell berry comes to mind as well and and, and they were both i think um you know mutual admirers in some respects um that there is actually a kind of joy to be found right there, there's a joy in providing for yourself and for your family in these very small ways that you're describing um, you know, it was interesting in, in the early um, months of, of the pandemic when many people sort of rediscovered uh, or for the first time discovered uh, how to bake bread, right? Mm. It was just kind of passing, sadly seeming like a passing, passing fad. Uh, I think there was a bit of joy in rediscovering that that you could do something for yourself and that and that it was, it took time and it took a bit of care, but that it, it is in that that their kind of reward lay that we had forgotten about um, as, a, as a society. Um, and so, so giving people a taste of that um, and leading them, myself included, is not not just others, you know, but but rediscovering these joys, so that we can see that, uh, you know, the the alternative to the present structure, techno-economic structures of life with all of their disorders, is not a kind of um, you know dire apocalyptic uh scene with you know monty python-esque like um you know bring out your dead kind of scenarios um but that there there are ways of ordering society that uh may be may be better may not give us as many things as we now think we need but if we recognize in fact that those we don't in fact need some of those things and that there are better and deeper joys and satisfactions um, along the path that Illich suggested, for example, uh, then I think you can you can begin uh, over a very, admittedly, very long scale of time um, to change society more, um, more, more deeply at a more profound level. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense at all. Yes, and again, yeah. I Yes, and I think um, I would go even further to say, like, I think a lot of people think, um, like, uh, my training, my background is as an environmental sociologist, so I'm steeped in, like, a lot mm -hmm. of environmentalist-type uh, communities, mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people think 
solutions to anything have to be horrible. I mean, they have to be like mm -hmm. less. Yeah. They have to be taking something away. You know, you have to deprive right. yourself. And I would go further, um, I think, even and say some of these simple simple solutions or small scale solutions are in fact exactly what you're saying like joyful um and mm -hmm. in the meantime maybe it's not even because you want to change society or whatever maybe it's just because you would like more joy and humanity and connection in yes, your life right. and it's a good thing independent of of whether or not right. it scales to solve all the problems at once or anything like that like it could just be independently beautiful and joyful and um also give you a you know small amount of sovereignty and and give you a, like a little bit of resistance to the machine and the you know te techno capitalist mm -hmm. society and all of that um so uh, yeah that's uh, i yeah i totally agree with you um is it, oh, so this is perfect for the next question i was going to ask you um to define um conviviality um and maybe some examples of how we get to conviviality in the modern world but i just want to um uh, to bring up something you you've talked about on a couple other podcasts, um, which Illich, I think, talked a lot about um, friendship, hospitality. Mm -hmm. um, I love yes. you brought this up already, the idea of small gatherings in like a living room with colleagues mm -hmm. and you have like this sort of um, trust built so that the mm -hmm. free exchange of ideas can grow out of that. Like it's sort of the substrate is trust which is so different from mm -hmm. Twitter or, you know, even mainstream media now, like we don't have that substrate of trust for truth to arise mm -hmm. out of. So just this idea of, of the scale um, where you have like these trusting and almost loving relationships, which would then allow for like maybe um, stretching a bit on uh, disagreements, but it comes from a place of good faith so that truth can arise out of that. You can have this back and forth. Maybe you can be wrong in public, like you can be wrong with your ideas and work them out as you're as you're speaking as you, as opposed to now which is sort of like you need to know exactly what you think at all times and it can't change yeah. otherwise you um aren't a legitimate um thinker or something right. like that whereas i think in the past there was this you know even essay culture is like this idea of essay is um is uh, i think etymologically related to this idea yeah. and sayo like it's it's an attempt it's an attempt at an idea attempt right yeah yes. so yes. um you know these yeah. these different things so yeah let's uh let's talk a little bit about conviviality and like um and what that might look like yeah yeah and it's funny you just connected something for me that i've never connected so in sayo in spanish you know which is a kind of trial right or something that that is etymologically related to the same word French word for essay. Yeah, very good. Um, that was my husband, so, by the way. I need to, um, he's a Spanish guy, so he's the one who told me that. Yeah, <laughs> have to yeah that was very him. good. That was my first language, uh, you know, oh. so I sometimes don't, don't even think about it. Um, but um, yes, I, you know, Illich develops the idea of conviviality specifically as a kind of alternative to industrial society, uh, to industrial scale society that, that has some of these problems that we've been talking about, the problems of scale, uh, the problems of creating um dependence uh in uh, re rendering people um cons as consumers uh mere consumers in in multiple facets of life um to say nothing of the kind of you know environmental degradation you know this great this very illich has, has a very prophetic voice obviously um and um there's this great past where he talks about these three you know effects of the present trajectory that we're on you know one of them is environmental degradation um you know political um polarization i don't think that's quite the word he uses but that's essentially the idea and then um psychological impotence by which you know today i would say you know a mental health crisis right which is you know all three evidently um where we find ourselves uh and so how how you know that's the 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 trajectory of of industrial scale society as, as Illich understood it, um, conviviality was his attempt to formulate an alternative. And, and this is part of what I what, what drew me to Illich was that it was not only a critique, it, it was it was a very insightful critique, in fact, a, a critique that went much deeper in many cases uh, than others might offer, um, but also some at least you know, hints at a way forward, some yeah. alternative, some, some language for an alternative. Um, and so the the idea of of conviviality, I think, brings to mind um, uh, again the human scale, um, the the scale at which the the individual can be 
recognized and also empowered and equipped uh, rather than rendered just a, a perpetual consumer of services and goods. Um, it it facilitated it, it, so a convivial tool was one that that the user um, could master. Now it's interesting because Illich does come in that in that trajectory that I was discussing earlier. There is a point at which he says that I I fail to see something, uh, and what he failed to see in the in the early seventies was that we had entered what he called the age of systems, that we had passed from the age of instruments into the age of systems. Um, he he never, to my knowledge, um, writes out a, a really in-depth analysis or, or, or statement of, of what he means by that, but there are hints here and there. And, and the idea, I think, generally is that um, his break with certain uh, early members of the cybernetic community, I think, is indicative of this. Um, and, and the idea is that the the, the instrument is the th is the tool that we can imagine ourselves standing apart from and mastering. Not it, it doesn't necessarily or automatically master us. The system envelops us mm. and envelops us in such a way that we can never achieve that kind of separation, that kind of mastery. Um, and I think for you know for Illich it may be as, as a product of moving into the computer age or the cybernetic age, we've entered the age of systems. So it's, it's, a, it's more, it's a more challenging proposition. Um, but in any case, in the seventies, when he's writing about conviviality, the convivial tool is the one um, that, that I can use. It doesn't use me, right? Uh, I don't become a tool of my tool in Thoreau's formulation of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that's one aspect of it. Um, it, it fosters mutual inter interdependence, as we've talked about already, uh, there's one aspect of conviviality. So I don't become uh, dependent upon um, a scaled up institution, but rather I am empowered to then participate in a living community of interdependence. Um, and, and again, all of the um, benefits that come from that. So I think these are uh, some of the, the key aspects of conviviality. I think friendship becomes a very, I mean, it's there from the beginning, but it becomes a very pronounced theme uh, in, in the later years of his life um, and his stress on, there's a, there's a beautiful little exchange with uh, David Cayley in, in a book of his interviews. Um, and they're talking about the language of value and the good. Um, so, you know, in that quote you read from something I'd written earlier, um, the order towards the good, this is, you know, Illich uh, was, I think, very careful to, to be cognizant of the power of words to shape mm. how we think about things. And so he wanted to move away from the value of uh, the, the language of value, um, which was already uh, the language of, of economics, of scarcity, uh, and to speak of the good. Um, and, and so when we are thinking about, you know, the 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 good and how we pursue it, and in this later part of his life, it's it's in it's in this conversation with Kaylee. Kaylee says, "Well, you know, is it is it possible at a society wide level?" Here's that question about you know the scale of action, right? Is it possible at a society wide level to recover the language of the good? Uh, and Illich's response is, uh, "Between between you and I, right now in this moment, yes, right." So. Mm -hmm not thinking about that scale can i always can i change the way society thinks about something but but in this moment between you and i then it is possible to recover this you know um and it's in that context of friendship um and so i think that that's um you know an essential part of it i will i'll add one more just element to this um which is i think a key thing in Illich that i would be remiss to not mention at some point here and that is the the desire to receive existence as a kind of gift, mm. uh, not as something to be managed. Uh, th this is in Illich's work right from the beginning. Um, it's in the uh, the closing essay of Deschooling Society, for example, where he contrasts the Epimethean man to Promethean man. Uh, and I think the difference is, is precisely that. Uh, if, if we understand our own lives, society, our friendships, all, all aspects of our experience as projects to be managed, risks to be mitigated, areas where we can impose our will through instruments of control and manipulation, right? That's one way of living. That's one way of ordering society. Uh, the other is to, to recognize existence as a gift uh, and to be willing to receive it as such, 
uh, to resist the temptation to manage it, uh, to remain open, as Illich says, uh, to the su to surprise, uh, which I think was you know his way of sneaking in the concept of grace into non-religious conversations, right? Uh, that there is this you know willingness to be open to the surprise, to hear the call of the moment uh, of what is needed in the moment, what is good in the moment to do. Um, and not to impose the good, but be, to be ready to be responsive to the demands of the good in a given moment. Um, but this is a, a, a change at, at, I think, the most fundamental level in the way we are oriented towards existence. Um, and so I think that that's also part of the, maybe the deep structure of conviviality. Uh, it involves this recognition of life as a gift. Um, Wendell Berry has a lovely line. It says, we live the given life, not the planned in one of his Sabbath poems, mm -hmm. uh, the given life, the gifted life, not the planned. And I think those are the options before us. Um, the, and, and, and how we, whether from the beginning, if our starting point is the planned, the managed, the risk mitigated life, that's going to inexorably lead us down certain paths to make certain choices, uh, to create certain outcomes. Whereas if we, I think are, are prepared to receive life as a gift, it opens up whole new possibilities for us. Mm, I love that so much. And I was going to ask about Christianity later, but I'm going to ask about it now, but uh, a couple of notes. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I, you, maybe you don't believe this, but I have, I do think that I am trying very hard and me and our little Doomer Optimism Circle are trying very hard to use Twitter as a convivial tool. <laughs> And we are <laughs> basically like just ignoring the cult, the culture war stuff. Yeah. We're sharing mm -hmm. with each other in friendship. We see individual friendships blossoming um, mm -hmm. out of it. People are encouraging one another. A lot of us are homesteaders or homeschoolers sharing information, you know, saying like, well, what, what, a, you know, my, my friend Roxanne is constantly baking these beautiful pies with her daughters and, you know, just look mm -hmm. at how beautiful these pies are that you've made um, and just sharing that and holding one another up. So I, I like, I, even though I am quite a Luddite, I do think sometimes you can with enough muscle and grit and agency, even use something as uh, chaotic as uh, Twitter as a convivial tool. Um, we're not perfect at it, and it's and it's um, yeah. it's got quite a bit of pull, institutional pull on its own. But I think it's it's kind of cool to think about, you sure. know, almost anything. Not almost anything, but a lot of things can be used in one way or another. They're not necessarily this totalizing force. Um, and another thing I just want to point out, I love this idea. I've been, a lot of people have been, um, in this sphere have been arguing about like, <clears throat> like how, how do you know what the good is, you know, and how do you even have these relationships across like value systems, people raised in different contexts, living in different places in the world. Like, and I love this idea of the scale of the friendship as a way of, um, knowing what the good is and almost also demonstrating through behavior what the good is and what the value system is between the two friends um by mm -hmm. by action rather than like this top down modeling of like this is what the values are supposed to be and and um and yeah. sort of like punishment but as opposed the opposite of that is just sort of like being supportive and um, being friendly and you can kind of see that it's mutually um, beneficial to both parties and they're enjoying that part of the friendship and um, and it's the, the good is kind of like co-created at a scale that's yes, so. between two friends, which I think is really yeah. beautiful and hopeful because a lot of us have been struggling with this lately, like, yeah. you know, maybe we can't be friends from being in different places in the world, like, and I think this is a hopeful note for 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 us who are doing attempting to do a kind of like mm -hmm. cosmo localism like we have a local community yeah. we have our families but we're also having these friendships over over space um so my question then that i was going to go to later we can do now um a lot of us a lot of people in our sphere and and adjacent to it are um newly coming to religion um whether like either explicitly um con converting to something like catholicism and are interested in things like the latin mass and like the tradition of it all and the gravity of like mm -hmm. the whole western tradition um or i guess in my case it would be more of like a, i grew up um religious but not super strongly religious but like sort of leaning into a lot of the um i think what were to me the best parts of 
um, religion, which were like sort of guiding moralities and and ideas of you know how to how to you know relate to one another and to to have grace and to um, experience existence as a gift and all of these things like you you said. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are, or maybe drawing on Illich, um, where do we draw lessons from religion in all of this? Um, I I heard you on this other a couple other podcasts saying you know there are of course, ways in which the church, church, churches, or like the Catholic Church, for example, has become institutionalized itself and has its limitations in this way. Um, like, what is the best approach to religion today? Um, and I, I have a kind of skepticism that I don't, I don't want, um, I don't necessarily want to say join a church; it'll solve everything. Like, and just go headfirst into either a new religion or back to religion. Like, just cautiously in my in my estimations it's a good idea to cautiously um adopt solutions and see how they work for you and see if like something like adopting a religion would be uh good for you but maintain a healthy skepticism like maybe there's parts of this that i don't like that kind of thing but i don't know if that's like my rationalist <laughs> brain speaking so i wonder yeah. i wonder your thoughts you know on religion and you know for for people who are who are yeah. grappling with all of these problems sure uh, there's a there's an interview you can actually find it out, find it online um, from the late '60s where uh, Illich is being interviewed in French. I think uh, he he spoke um, about a dozen languages, but this one I think is in French and it's in black and white. And Illich is very young. Um, I think he was still a priest in good standing. He remained the priest throughout his life, um, but um, stopped dispensing his duties at one point because of some conflicts with the, the hierarchy of the church. But in any case, uh, Illich is, is um, actually drawing on on Greek myth a good bit. He's talking about Epimetheus and Prometheus, I think, in this context. And and uh, the interviewer towards the end uh, asks him, well, you know, uh, I think with the precise question, I can't remember, is something like, you know, you you haven't mentioned God <laughs> this whole time, right? Uh, you know, what kind of what kind of priest are you? Um, and uh, and Illich, um, you know, says something like, well, you know, I, I don't I don't like to embarrass my friend. Um, it's, it's a very uh, the sense of of his his spirituality, if, if we can put it that way, um, for brevity's sake, um, was something very dear and private. Uh, not private in the sense that that is compartmentalized. Uh, intimate might be a better word, um, and it was very real. And and I think uh, maybe the sense, the the impression that I got uh, is that kind of dragging it out in order to make. Um, you know his his points more convincing, or to give it a kind of authority, authority um, that's borrowed from religion, as if as if the you know the the faith becomes a uh, a means towards something other than itself, um, mm -hmm. and that, that resonated with me. So I, um, I I think as it would have been for for Illich, although it wasn't obvious in his as much of his private writing. Um, the whole thing is is kind of framed by my um by my understanding, understanding of the world which is fundamentally religious right it's fundamentally grounded in uh, the idea that that um we are creatures uh that there is that it, when i say it is a gift um that i mean that quite quite straightforwardly mm -hmm. um and that uh we we do wait um and experience moments of grace that we um, that there is a, a kind of order that we can aspire to that grounds the good um, as however we go about discovering it. So those are those are in fact very concrete propositions. To speak in a public context um, and to um, to address some of these core human questions, uh, I, I don't know that early on, it might not even have been a conscious decision on my part that I that I wouldn't speak in this explicitly theological vein, um, but rather speak out of it in, in a way that can be heard in a way that addresses common human questions. Uh, and if it if it if it becomes a path for some people towards, uh, you know, more explicitly theological considerations and questions and fine. Um, uh, so I, you know, I'm not sure I have um, you know, I, I I wrestle internally with how I navigate these questions for myself and and how I you know speak in a public context. Um, but I think it is is certainly fundamental uh, for me in the way I understand these things. 
Um, and, and I think it would have been for Illich as well. At the same time, um, you, yeah, you alluded to what you know the role the church plays in this. You know, Illich, Illich was very explicit, especially in in um, uh, the, in the interview that became uh, Rivers North of the Future, that he he sees the he's able to diagnose Western institutions and its disorders because he he first saw it in the church itself uh, in, in as late as you know early as the late Middle Ages. Um, and so that the church has gone wrong, uh, and it's the, this his notion of um, the, the Latin phrase translated as you know the corruption of of the best is the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, the best in that case was the church, and its corruption is the worst. In the way of models, um, you know the the kinds of institutional dependencies and authoritarianism that later becomes um, part, part of his critique of other institutions, I think, is important to note. Um, but that there is, you know. That there is this, you know, encounter with the gratuity of being that leads to gratitude. It leads to a sense of stewardship over the world. It, it recognizes that that our limits are not simply there to be um, transcended, but to be inhabited. Uh, those are all, for me, explicitly religious, not, philosoph not just merely philosophical notions. Um, and I think that the I the idea for me is to to allow um, the beauty of that of of what is good to draw others toward itself right and so so if i um am able to to live the good in relationship as you described you know to uh to see uh in my neighbor to be responsive to the needs of my neighbor um Illich, you know has a wonderful way of understanding the the parable of the good samaritan right and, and it is that uh in that moment the samaritan hears a call he says the problem with that story is that we turn it into an obligation, and then we find ourselves soon enough, uh, you know, justifying bombing our our neighbor for their good. Right. Uh, but rather that it's a, it's a call, rather than um, than than this obligation. You know, when you make it an obligation, you corrupt it. But if you you're responsive to the call, if I'm responsive to the good of of, of my neighbor and I'm able to love in that way, there's a, a, a beauty that shines forth from from those acts. Um, and so there's a way that beauty then draws others in non-coercive ways. Um, and I think that's an important element of what is lost um, in, in the way that religion is often invoked uh, in public discourse um, in, in, in the political arena. Um, you know, I, 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 you know, I very much think that, you know, that, that desire for, for power to impose the good as they understand it, all, all of that is, is, you know, extremely dangerous. Um, and it's been a powerful temptation um, that the church has not always resisted uh, well. So um, I don't know. Uh, th uh, those are some of my thoughts along that. Um, yeah, that access that yeah. that resonates a lot with me. I also um, I'm just kind of skeptical in general of somebody who who is like imposing the good external to me in a way that's like, um, I guess, not embedded or embodied in our relationship or context, you know, so yeah. people, I think, um, sort of drawing on like religious authority to determine what's good without really knowing the context or even being a part of it or having any skin right. in the game with it. It's like, um, that part, I'm really skeptical about. Um, but on the other hand, yeah. more and more time, the more and more time I spend, like, you know, just in these kinds of conversations, I realize there is like a deeply <laughs> theological, basis for a lot of what I think is good. Um, and, um, you know, I think if I think about my, my dissertation research, I was, um, interviewing people who do small scale food production in Chicago. And a lot of them were just so different politically, economically, culturally from one another. Um, but they could like, you know, there was this one, there was this event called the Chicago chicken coop tour and people were just sharing, you know, people were opening their backyard so they could see each other's chicken coops and people were coming and just like seeing, you know, there's children, you know, with a little joy on their face, just seeing these chickens and talking about mm -hmm. it. It's so wholesome. I mean, people know the good um, when they mm -hmm. see it and especially in context like that, in the fullness of context, mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. community, it made neighbors meet one another yeah. when they didn't before connection with, you know, your food and, and where it comes from these animals that are like creation that are just giving, mm -hmm. um, us food and life. Um, people, people know it, I think. And so, um, but I get, again, I think in that con context in that relational space is really mm -hmm. an important caveat. Um, mm -hmm. and another thing I think about is, 
my uncle's in um AA and he always told me whenever I would go to him for advice like um in AA they say just make the next right choice um mm -hmm. and I thought that that was really that was a very powerful heuristic for me um because yes, yeah. it's sort of like okay I don't know what all of these other things are I don't know I can't play you know 4d chess figuring out um yeah. what all the next steps will be but i could just in this context make what's what seems right to me and it it's just a iterative thing and it's in, in the small enough scale to understand like what the good is in this moment yeah. um mm -hmm. okay so uh i want to briefly touch on education um mm -hmm. i know that um you know illich had a whole thing about you know de-schooling um you know, sort of primary education and, and you know, different ways in which we could approach education in that, um, in may maybe a more convivial way. Um, but then I also want to talk about um, the Christian Study Center and just, you know, your maybe vision for higher education too. And I should just briefly say, um, <clears throat> my kids, uh, we live in Uruguay and, and they go to a one-room schoolhouse um, with mm -hmm. like, 14 kids and one teacher <laughs> and mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. between six and 12 or whatever um mm -hmm. and it's lovely um and if if i were in the u.s and it was i had only the option of like like giant classrooms with small amount of teachers and institutional schooling i might do homeschooling um i know a lot of people doing um homeschooling co-ops or starting schools mm -hmm. um a yeah. lot of people i know are starting schools and just taking completely radical approaches to school small classroom sizes like we're just going to focus on classical philosophy or we're just going to you know a christian boys school or you know all these different experiments which, which i love um and then in terms of higher education um my day job is hosting american university students here in Uruguay and they work mm -hmm. alongside um, small-scale family farmers and mm -hmm. get their hands dirty and plant trees yeah. and do all this fun stuff and I think there's also something to be said of you know just getting out of the classroom and and you know having experiential learning to some extent mm -hmm. getting you know connecting with other people and not just um necessarily you know being in the ivory tower but I also love like I went to undergraduate at the University of Chicago and I like loved the you know, the debate format, the classroom where we're, mm -hmm. you know, where, where we have mutual trust and we can, you know, get yes. at the truth through discussion, small, small, um, you know, 10 person discussion classes. So, yeah, just just education in general. What what kind of optimism <laughs> can be, we be looking toward? What what should we be envisioning? Yeah. Uh, um, so that's a great, again, mostly labor, multifaceted question. Um, the. So, so maybe I'll start. I'll, I'll approach it this way. Um, so, the study center um, is is a small institution. Um, we're not connected to the university. Uh, we don't offer credit, um, and and we don't charge for anything that we offer. So we host uh, reading groups. Um, I lead an eight or ten week class each semester where we provide lunch and we you know get to talk about. Um, for example, this past semester we just wrapped up a an eight week course on uh, attention in the moral life, mm. which has been an important thing for me over the years. Um, I, I've actually taught a, a, a eight week course on the thought of Ivan Illich uh, as well. Uh, so uh, you get to do a lot of fun things, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, we and we also I invite speakers to come uh, and give uh, lectures and, and I do both um, the public traditional public lecture, but over the past couple of years, what I've started doing is having a, a kind of lunchtime seminar where it's a, a smaller crowd and it's more conversational um, so that we can do some of what we've been you know, talking about. Um, you know, uh, Christine Emba, who recently wrote a book called Rethinking Sex, was with us uh, recently to do that same kind of public and then um, seminar event. And I think part of what I understand this center to do we're one of um of many um i think there may be there's a consortium which is sort of a loose um association of similar institutions and there are about maybe 40 member institutions of differing sizes and, and they differ they, they will each differ to some degree they have some overlapping similarities but the way i think about what we do here is um i've put it this way i think i i, I would like for this um center to be a haven for thoughtfulness so that means combating a lot of different um, default settings of of our our lives, e even for students in a in a high powered state university, um, where we 
you know, we are often driven by um, either competitiveness or um, this idea that we're preparing ourselves for the market uh, or that we must you know, achieve certain uh, grades in order to enter grad school. So it's always, you know, uh, learning for the sake of something other than learning right, is one way of maybe framing part of the problem. Um, and we lack, uh, in the technical sense of the term, the the kind of leisure that is required for the life of the mind. So to to try to create that space so that you know, as I said, we uh, we're not going to give you any credit, right? So there's there's no outcome you're checking uh, to to get out of what you do here. Um, neither are we going to charge you anything. Um, and you know, we gather or you know, ten people maybe around a, a, a book or an essay. Uh, with no particular agenda except to uh, to read together, to think together, to raise questions together. Um, so to give a place for this life of the mind for its own sake. Um, and so I think part of the problem with the way education has come to be understood um, is that we, we think of it very instrumentally. Uh, it is for the sake of something, and, and that something uh, is almost always um, career oriented, right, or earnings oriented. And so the disciplines that don't seem to contribute to that outcome are, of course, the first to be cut when funding runs low um, and to be kind of given second, you know, secondary status within the university. Uh, and so there are a lot of ways in which, and, and, and even apart from that, so just the pace of contemporary life, right, where the 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 temporal demands the busyness this this the ubiquitous distraction right so if i can you know in this institution create a space where there's a kind of haven from all of that mm. so that we may rediscover um you know the the joy of learning uh the joy of of coming to understand uh the world a little better uh through our conversations with others and through engagement with a, a text um i think that's as part of what I, you know, hope for for the institution, um, it, it is, you know, the Christian Study Center. So that means that we do have, you know, place a, a special premium on the resources of the Christian intellectual tradition, which, which even within the church gets neglected. Um, you know, there's there are wonderful resources. Um, Illich is one of them. Uh, you know, Lulz is another in the 20th century. Um, you know, going back to various thinkers in the history of the church that, that are just simply not going to show up uh, at a Sunday, in a Sunday sermon. Um, and so we want to create a, you know, a place where we, you know, people can encounter those voices uh, and the wisdom that they may offer for our contemporary setting. So um, that's, I think, one way of answering this question of education, right? It, 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 it is not, um, I think part of the problem is that if we, if we think of it, of education and learning only in terms of what happens in an institution, um, that's where we, you know, where we might first go wrong, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, we can think about learning as something that happens much more, more organically in a variety of contexts. Um, and it goes back to that similar, um, similar to the anecdote about the, 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 you know, my friend's colleague who didn't want to converse with and console another person without the professional present, right? If we think, you know, well, you know, teaching is what the certified teacher, I say this as, as someone who spent most of his life in the classroom, um, you know, teaching uh, middle school, high school and college students. Um, so it's fine, teachers are great. Uh, but I, I, I would never have wanted anybody to think that, uh, you know, I, I'm the only, you know, I can, I can teach in a way that they can't just because I, I took some methods courses at university, you know. Um, so that, you know, we, we, we think, about who can educate, in what context can learning happen, um, and what is it? What are its aims? Um, what what is the good that we seek in learning? Um, and um, yeah, there was a, there was another point there, but I confess it just kind of went off uh, off sideways from me. Well, I would just um, I would just add. It reminds me what you're saying here at the end too. Um, reminds me of what we were talking about before, which is um, you know insert. In certain contexts, certain tools are necessary, but you don't want to go at such an extreme direction. Yeah. So like the the teacher as authority um, or the output of learning outcomes or something like that, um, some amount of that is good. I And I think about when my, my mm -hmm, kids go right. to school here and um, part of what I want them to have is a gentle sense of another adult's authority that is different from mine and them being able to mm -hmm. adapt to 
the social context of you're going to have other, you know, experiences of authority or other kinds of relationships outside of the home that you would need to navigate. But if it goes so far in the direction where like all of school is just sit still and all of school is just yes. you know, learning to testing outcomes, um, then it's right. just like a, an absurd yeah. overcorrection um, of those, like the little seeds of what's good about it, um, right. what could be a, a, a beneficial aspect of of education. Right. And, and again, what we were talking about at the beginning, I think a lot of people overcorrect too and say like, you know, all of school is horrible. We're going to have to reinvent everything from scratch. And then they have like homeschooling that has no authority at all or no structure or standards at all. And, and, you know, I, I know some people who do unschooling and they are great and they, and it turns out fine. Um, but the, I think we just run the risk of overcorrecting in every direction. <laughs> and I worry about this, a yes, little bit, yeah. you know, where it's like, there is actually, there is a seed of something really important here. Um, you know, say your, your local public school has some things you don't like. Um, but, but on the other hand, if you, if it's, um, more beneficial than harmful, get involved in your public school. Um, it helps you meet other people in the community, have a stake right. in the community. So there's good things right to be had we don't need to throw everything out um but it's really hard we're we're just in a world where we're navigating so many things at once and like you were saying we have like no attention yeah um and distraction it's really hard um to figure all those things out but you know just putting it yeah. out into the universe right. of the things i worry about right yeah although yeah and you put your finger on something important there there, there are so few things that now we can we have to think about almost everything from scratch, it seems like, or it feels that way in a lot of cases. Um, and especially when you sort of become aware of problems that need maybe a more radical solution, something more than just kind of tinkering at the margins. And then you do become, it, the temptation is to uh, overreact, overcorrect, uh, and, and such fine discernment is needed in so many of these cases. Um, not that you're going to get it perfect just by for, for thing, you know, forethought, but um, but that it, it does require a kind of wisdom, you know, it, it, there's no 10 step program for it all, oftentimes, no. right? And, and intuition, and so, the amount of intuition yeah, you need to yeah, navigate right. these things like, oh, I think I might be going too yeah. far in this direction. Yeah, right, right. Uh, and, and the capacity to, to do that uh, and to have a community to support you in doing this. Um, yes, I think this is where unfortunately we find ourselves, but but it can be, it's, it's, a, it's an exhausting place to be, I think, uh, but it's, it it's also can be a very hopeful place to be um, because, you know, as we said, seeds of something new, you know, get planted, I think, in these kinds of circumstances. Um, and so, yeah, to try to preserve, preserve something of the, the joy and excitement of the moment, uh, I think is also helpful. Yeah. And I think that basically yeah. that's the project of this podcast, too, is um, yeah. more or less to think about these things out loud in front of an audience so that, you know, not everybody yeah. has to start from scratch thinking about um, how to navigate these myriad problems and what kind of solutions they should be looking toward, et cetera, et cetera. But to instead, right. like, you know, draw on people who have been thinking about these things. Um, okay, so right. final question. And I'm just going to tweak this a little bit. Um, I, I was thinking a little bit in terms of, you know, um, uh, trying to understand what is good. We talked about this a little bit. Um, what promotes human flourishing? I was thinking about maybe the role of the mesosphere, like something like custom and tradition. And we talked a little bit about that. And something that's been coming up for me lately, and I don't know if you're familiar with this term or this sort of cultural philosophical movement called metamodernism. But basically, the idea is, you know, there's this, uh, you know, traditional era, and then, you know, this modern era and this postmodern era. And mod metamodernism is a way to like synthesize um, maybe some of the best parts of modernity, um, the the skepticism of postmodernity, um, and draw back on tradition. And something that came up for me recently is two things. Um, one thing I've always loved is this idea of this Jeffersonian dinner. And Thomas Jefferson had this idea. It's like only, I think like eight to 12 people only. You have to have a conversation between everybody. Mm -hmm. You have to have a topic you talk about. Like there's all these rules. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that so much because it's such a it just feels like such a cool human scale thing. And also it was, you know, invented hundreds of years ago and we can still use it and it still mm -hmm. works. Um, and another thing that came up just very recently to me is Benjamin Franklin came up with this idea of Jinto clubs, which again are like clubs of up to 12 people, civic clubs of people who like, you know, have, have live in the same place or sort of civic leaders and, and want their mutual thriving um, and help one another. But also they just get together once a month or something and debate like ideas and philosophy. Um, 
so I guess right now I'm just kind of in this uh, this moment where I'm thinking about um, let's not start everything from scratch. Let's look back to some of the traditions that are already sort of whole and exist and are ready for us. We we have like a whole um, bunch of intellectual traditions and cultural um, I don't know technologies to pull from, but bringing them into the mm -hmm. modern era and um, and testing them out and seeing how they interact with these with us as these modern humans. I I wonder if that resonates with you at all. Yeah, certainly. I, you know, meta metamodernism is one of these terms that I, you know, I've encountered on various points, but I've, I've never um, sort of followed through and, and tried to. You that know, was me like a month ago, and it or... finally clicked. It's like a, it's like a synthesis. But yeah, I, I really just dis disliked yeah, the term yeah. when I first heard it because I was like, I don't know what this means. Yeah. <laughs> One <laughs> what more you know I, navigating twitter is often a, you know these uh moment by moment decisions of, of what do i want to try to understand yes, uh, that same. i've now just encountered for the first time um and, but i but I, certainly the idea that um you know we don't want to simply reject um modernity wholesale it, what you know whether we can even very precisely define it um uh, or, or that we want to dip back into the wisdom of the past. I think this is, you know, yes, this is right. This is good. Um, uh, the the formats you described, I, you know, I'm I'm certainly a a big proponent of uh, gathering people around the table, um, and it's a very humane um, and and timeless uh, way of of bringing people together. Um, hospitality is one of the um sort of key words here at at, at our center uh we have um a part of the center is a coffee shop um this is not something all centers have but we have a coffee shop uh so it's open to the community it, it hosts you know all sorts of conversations that flourish around the building um you know i mentioned earlier in bringing speakers and wanting not just the 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 speaker behind the lectern uh but the one gathered around the table with 10 or 12 people maybe uh, maybe 15. um so that there is this opportunity uh, to to converse in earnest, um, as I'll tell you, it's kind of funny but telling story. After one of our larger events, there was a student um, that immediately turned around to the person behind them. I know this because the person they turned around to was somebody who used to work for us, and, and we chatted about this later. But uh, the student turned around and, and said, "Would you please talk to me about these things?" Uh, <laughs> and so there, there was this thirst for conversation, right? This thirst for uh, a meaningful conversation that's not, not just kind of key to whatever the crisis du jour on social media might be, um, but it was um, it was this, it, it betrayed this deeply felt human need to connect with another person um, at this very humane scale, person to person, uh, but also about things that mattered and to converse with others about them and to be seen and heard in this way in this setting. Um, so creating context for that, uh, I think, you know, whether we do that, you know, in our homes uh, or we find these civic clubs that are able to do that. You know, I think I think there are, um, you know, we, we focus so much on all this that's going wrong. Um, but I, I do increasingly hear about experiments in this in, in in these kinds of opportunities, kinds of gatherings, these kinds of ways of bringing people together. Uh, you know, and may they may they all flourish. Um, you know, I, I certainly think this is part of what I'm see myself trying to do here um and so i'm you know i'm i'm all for that you know illich would say you know uh gather gathering a few people around spaghetti in a, in a bottle of wine that doesn't even have to be very expensive uh, you know was uh was the way to do it so certainly so i love that all right well on that note um for everyone listening um host a dinner party um, look up Jeffersonian dinner and uh, follow those rules. No more than 12 people. Everyone has to have the same conversation. I think it's a, a great way to practice the tool, a, a tool for conviviality. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Michael, thank you so much. Um, any last thoughts? Where can people find you, follow you? Yeah, my newsletter is the Convivial Society. It's on Substack, um, and um, I am on Twitter. I don't necessarily recommend people go find me there. <laughs> if you're not on Twitter, don't certainly don't come for my sake. I'll feel bad. Uh, <laughs> but uh, if if you do, LM Sacas is that's uh, where I'm at. And um, and then yes, you know the Christian Study Center here in Gainesville, Florida. You can look up to see more about what we do if you like. Uh, but the newsletter is the primary way they probably can keep up with things that are related to this conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm.